Biggest Cut Rocks in the World On the side of China's Yanmen Shan Mountain is an archaeological site that defies explanation. The legendary Yangshan Quarry is here, partially concealed by the wild forest. 1800 years ago, humans climbed the mountain and began quarrying stone from this remote site. It then remained in use up until the 14th century. But what exactly happened at the quarry is still a major mystery. In 1368, Emperor Zhu Yuanzhang chose Nanjing as his capital city. Nanjing is located about a dozen miles away from the quarry, situated in a much easier spot to access. In 1405, Emperor Zhu Yuanzhang died. So his son, the new emperor, ordered the construction of a giant memorial steel to commemorate his father. The son ordered his men to cut and shape three giant blocks of stone from the very mountain then transport them to Nanjing. There, they'd be added to the Ming Xiaoling Mausoleum. However, the blocks were too big. Workers carved the stone for years, but eventually, they gave up the project. They realized that there was no possible way to move the blocks. This is what the legend says, but it might not be what happened in reality. What modern archaeologists know for sure is that there are unfinished blocks at the quarry that are considered the biggest megaliths in the world. And on the side of the mountain are unfinished blocks that have a combined weight of 31,000 tons. To give you some reference, the largest official stone monolith ever transported is the Thunderstone. It was moved by Russia in 1770, and the monument weighed 1,250 tons. In comparison, the biggest stone at Stonehenge is the Heel Stone, which weighs only 30 tons. The baffling part is that the emperor thought that such huge stones could be used for anything never mind transported down the slope of a mountain. So was this a monumental failure, or are these blocks part of something else entirely? The huge stones could have been part of a lost city on the mountain, or part of a city that never got finished. The Yangshan Quarry is so much more mysterious than what you see on the surface. Experts have even identified engraved patterns on the stones that look similar to what you'd expect in a ritualistic space. Some markings are so precise that they couldn't have been made by a chisel, suggesting that a much more advanced piece of machinery was responsible. And although the big stones have never moved, it does appear as if millions of tons of rock have been taken from the quarry. This was likely over a period of centuries, maybe even millennia. What do you think is the real history of China's isolated mountain? Are the ruins of a city older than time buried here? How did ancient Chinese workers move millions of tons of rock, and why? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. The Iron Castle The Iron Castle isn't impossible to reach, but it certainly isn't easy. This ancient fortification is located deep in the wilds of Spain. It was used as a Moorish stronghold over 700 years ago, but now it's crumbling to pieces in the Cadiz Mountains. In Spain, it's called El Castillo de Hierro. The imposing ruin stands on the precipice of a rocky mountain peak far above the quaint village of Pruna. Even though it's in a state of disrepair, it's been partially restored. Just imagine what it looked like before the restoration work. It was hardly distinguishable from the clumps of rock surrounding it. Seven centuries ago, Muslim conquerors built the castle as a mighty defensive structure. And that's all I can tell you because not much else is known. There are no records of who built the castle, not a single one. The earliest record is from the later part of the 14th century. King Alfonso XI of Castile gave the castle as a gift to one of his noble pals. Then it was transformed into a residence. It was never used in any known battles. Instead, it stood at the edge of the mountain as a fancy lord's home until around the end of the 17th century. That was when the epic citadel was abandoned and slowly started falling into ruin. Even after so much lost history, the Iron Castle is an amazing place to visit. You can imagine what the Moors must have felt like standing at the mountaintop, surveying the trade roads and small farms in this remote part of their declining kingdom. The castle 10,000 feet in the clouds. At an 
altitude of around 10,000 feet, archaeologists in Turkey discovered the ruins of a truly epic fortress. It doesn't look epic right now because it's hardly even a ruin, with barely anything of the original structure surviving. But if you use your imagination, you can see how grand this castle in the sky was once upon a time. Just check out the remote place where the castle was discovered. Its ruins are at the top of Black Mountain, which is also known as Karadag, overlooking a vast landscape without a hint of civilization. The rolling mountains and deep valleys of Turkey's Gurpinar district look the same now as they did during the Iron Age when the castle was built. But who built the castle in the clouds and what happened to them? And how did such a seemingly miraculous fairy tale stronghold decay into a sad ruin? Scientists believe that the castle was built during the Urartian period. The kingdom of Urartu dominated the region around Lake Van in the 9th century BC. That was almost 3,000 years ago. They frequently found themselves at war with the much more famous Assyrian Empire and the Medes of Iran. Although they were initially quite powerful, too much war weakened them over time. And by the 6th century BC, they'd been conquered and destroyed. The Urartians left behind surprisingly sophisticated fortresses. Some of the strongholds they built rivaled the castles of the Middle Ages, and they were also well known for their excellent metalwork. Before moving on, I wanted to give a huge shout out to Michael Bryant and Yellow Ant for supporting Origins Explained. We wouldn't be here without viewers like you guys. Thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. Sunken Port Royal the most evil city on Earth is an amazing archaeological site that you can't visit because it's underwater. Although I suppose you could strap on an oxygen tank and go scuba diving. But if you don't want to get wet, the sunken city of Port Royal is impossible to explore. What made Port Royal the most sinful city in the world was its relationship with piracy. In the 17th century, it was the most notorious pirate haven that could be found anywhere in the world. It all began in 1655 when English soldiers captured Jamaica, stealing it from the Spanish. The port at the entrance of Kingston Harbor was an obvious strategic place where the English knew they needed to build defenses. The British completed fortifications and expanded the harbor to accommodate more ships. And with the harbor protected, merchants and pirates flocked to Kingston Harbor to trade their goods. The isolation and lawlessness of the new city of Port Royal attracted the worst of the Seven Seas. Piracy was so much more complicated than what you see on TV or in the movies. Pirates were the result of the relentless naval warfare being waged between England and Spain. The English monarchy allowed pirates to attack Spanish ships with impunity since it aided the English war effort. Instead of calling them pirates, the British called them buccaneers. They were, as horrible as it sounds, state-sanctioned terrorists on the high seas. Port Royal was right in the center of the Caribbean, at the very heart of the buccaneering playground. Pirates could hang out at Port Royal and easily strike any of the main shipping routes between Europe and the Americas. Famous pirate Henry Morgan lived in Port Royal, launching attacks from Cuba to Venezuela. And for his legendary feats of piracy, he was knighted and became the lieutenant governor of Jamaica. By the time he died in 1688, he was a very wealthy man. With so many pirates in Port Royal, the town became a cesspool for sin and debauchery. It was one of the richest ports in the world, full to the brim with taverns, gambling establishments, and seedy brothels. If you wanted to do something that was illegal everywhere else in the world, you took your boat and sailed to Port Royal. The good times didn't last forever, though. Some say that God intervened, just like in the biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah. On the morning of June 7th, 1690, an earthquake shook Port Royal. The land split open as if hell itself was about to be unleashed. The sky darkened and became red as the sound of crumbling mountains deafened the townsfolk. Geysers of water broke through the surface as the church tower collapsed. A great wall of seawater rose above the town, then crashed right into it. Houses were sucked into the watery depths, and the cemetery where Henry Morgan was buried suddenly lay beneath the ocean. 
About 2,000 people were killed instantly by the earthquake and tsunami. This was the end of Port Royal, and the end of piracy soon followed. In the early part of the 18th century, pirates were no longer needed. They'd served their purpose the century before and were becoming a general threat to everyone at sea. But pirates will be pirates. Savage captains like Calico Jack and Charles Vane refused to stop their piracy and were hunted down like dogs. Calico Jack was captured and hanged in 1720, and Vane was hanged in 1721. The Rongbuk Monastery Welcome to the highest religious building in the world. On the north face of Mount Everest, at an astounding 16,340 feet above sea level, is the Rongbuk Monastery. There isn't any other place in the world where you are physically and spiritually this close to the heavens. But good luck getting here! The monastery is home to about 30 Buddhist monks right now, including a few nuns at the local residence. The monastery was established at the start of the 20th century by a community of Buddhists. But even before it opened its doors in 1909, Buddhist monks and nuns lived on this high slope of Everest. They didn't have a monastery to call home. Instead, they lived in caves and huts. Imagine how devout they must have been to live in freezing cold caves on the world's tallest mountain. The monastery is surprisingly big, covered in statues of various Buddhist deities like Sakyamuni. Although there are only 30 monks living in the complex currently, there used to be an estimated population of 500. The monastery grew over time until it had seven chapels and a guest house for visitors. But as the decades passed, fewer and fewer monks called the monastery home. It became a tourist destination, catering to die-hard adventurers who were willing to scale the mountain, all just to reach this holy place. Kitum Cave Kitum Cave has been called the deadliest place on the planet. But you don't need to worry about it because chances are you will never accidentally stumble into its mouth of doom. The cave is hidden at the base of Mount Elgon, a shield volcano in Kenya. It's in a remote and inaccessible part of Africa, situated close to the border of Uganda. The extinct volcano is surrounded by dense forests, and it's protected by wild animals. It's also far from any tourist trails you might find on a map. Those who have had the rare displeasure of visiting Kitum Cave have described it as the doorway to evil. But why in the world is Kitum Cave so despised? The answer is going to rock your world. Although the cavern likely served as a shelter for native tribes in a time that no living person can remember, it is now a place of death. Scientists believe that Kitum Cave is the source of the Marburg virus and Ebola. This single cave may have produced two of the deadliest diseases known to modern humans. Now that you're aware of how treacherous the cave is, let me tell you how to get there. You have to start by taking a plane to Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. Then you'll travel along the Kinshasa Highway until you see the mountain. Next, you'll follow the rough path traveled by elephants for centuries until you find the entrance to the cave. The path to get here is an ancient one walked by villagers up until it was paved in the 1970s. But how do scientists know that the cave is the source of infection? In 1980, a French tourist visited Kitum Cave. Shortly after, the tourist suffered a severe headache, started vomiting, and came down with a fever. Then he began vomiting blood and oozing blood from every orifice of his body. Yep, you heard that right. Every orifice. It turned out that the tourists had contracted the Marburg virus. In 1987, almost an identical thing happened, but this time it was the tourists from Denmark. So it soon became clear that something in this cave was making people very sick. But what's in there? That's the big mystery that hasn't been solved. The cavern itself was made by volcanic activity. There are strange marks on the inside of the cave, almost as if it was mined. There are rumors that the Egyptians reached this place and mined for gold and diamonds. But it's only a rumor. The cavern is sometimes used as a sanctuary for buffaloes, hyenas, leopards, and antelopes. In the deeper and more terrifying parts of the cave, there are bats. It's likely the bat guano that's responsible for getting people sick when they enter. But as of now, nothing's Delta Terra Cerny. It doesn't get much more isolated than Greenland. After all, how many people do you know who have been on a leisurely vacation to the shores of Greenland? 
Probably not too many. On the northern shore of the Autonomous Territory is an archaeological site that few have ever seen. It's called Delta Terra Cerni, and it was once home to a group of pre-Inuit humans. Almost nothing is known about this ancient place. The site was found in 1948 by Danish archaeologist Igel Nuth. Hundreds of axes, pieces of driftwood, pointy sticks, and rolls of birch bark were uncovered. The team also found the remains of birds and fish, suggesting that the people who lived here were successful hunters. The most common thing found across the site have been bony needles and microblades. Microblades are tiny stone blades usually made from obsidian or quartz. They were the earliest version of microblades, and they were likely used to butcher and process animals. This is one of the world's most desolate ruins in one of the coldest places on the planet. It's a real ruin, too, not just a collection of random artifacts scattered across the frosty ground. Delta Terra Cerni originally stood about 75 feet above sea level. It was a fortification made of stone, sprawling over beaches and terraces. Archaeologists have even identified the rings of old tent sites, charcoal from fireplaces, and buried meat caches. But let's get into the good stuff. You're likely dying to know when people actually lived here. So let me fill you in. About 4,000 years ago, before the Inuit ever settled here, a group of Stone Age humans called this place home. They lived in their stone fortresses for roughly 300 years then abruptly disappeared. It's unclear where they came from or where they went after. However, I will tell you that experts say the ruins of the fortress look similar to other ruins in northern Eurasia. What do you think happened to the original inhabitants? Let me know in the comments below! The Deepest Canyon In the deepest canyon in the world, scientists have found the tallest tree in Asia. Who would have thought that to discover the tallest cypress tree in the world, scientists would have to explore the dense forest of a hidden valley? The tree stands an outstanding 335 feet tall. If you placed it next to the Statue of Liberty, it would still be 30 feet taller than the statue. The incredible discovery was made by a research team from Peking University. They looked for the tree deep in what's often referred to as the Grand Canyon of China. Its real name is the Yarlung Zhangbo Grand Canyon Nature Reserve, located in the Tibet Autonomous Region. The tree is in such a quiet, distant place that scientists don't even know what species of cypress it is. Maybe it's Himalayan or maybe it's Tibetan. But what we do know is that the monstrous trunk of the tree is almost 10 feet in diameter. China's Grand Canyon is vastly different from the American one. Its location and the unique ecosystem of Tibet has allowed it to flourish relatively unscathed by the outside world. It's such a pristine wilderness, populated by incredible types of flora and fauna, that scientists are desperate to preserve it. And that's exactly why scientists from Peking University investigated the canyon in the first place. It's one of the few places on the globe where most of the wilderness is left unbothered by human expansion. The jungle in the canyon is so deep that scientists had to use drones and laser radar equipment to scan the trees from a distance. Maybe ancient civilizations lived here, but nobody knows for sure. That's how remote the bottom of the canyon is. As a side note, I should probably tell you about the number one tallest tree in the world. It's in the Redwood National Park in California, and it was discovered in 2006. The tree is about 800 years old, and stands 381 feet tall. Its name is Hyperion, inspired by the titan of the same name from Greek mythology. Leon Viejo Leon Viejo stands as an impressive ancient city in Central America, holding a prominent place in the rich tapestry of Mesoamerican history. Yet it's in such an inaccessible place that nobody found it until recently. The very first capital of Nicaragua was lost for more than 300 years. The history of Leon Viejo is both terrifying and fascinating. It was founded as a small village by Spanish explorers in 1524. It's the oldest colonial settlement that was built by Spaniards anywhere in the Americas. However, the city never truly developed. One might even call it a failure, and a brutal one at that. Leon Viejo is the only early urban settlement in the New World that's kept its original design all of these years, although that's technically thanks to the fact that it was lost for so long. 
The founder was Francisco Hernández de Córdoba, a man who is very famous in Nicaragua. He is supposedly the founder of modern Nicaragua, with the nation's currency even named Córdoba after him. Francisco was supported by other famous conquistadors like Hernán Cortés as he waged a brutal war of subjugation, conquering Nicaragua at the beginning of the 16th century. But for all of his conquering, he couldn't escape the drama of New World politics. In 1526, he was dragged into the town square of León Viejo where he was beheaded as a traitor to his own people. His bones weren't found until an archaeological dig in the ruins of León Viejo in the year 2000. According to local legend, it was a sort of divine intervention that saw the city slowly decay. A few years after it was founded, it was rocked by a series of earthquakes. The nearby volcano of Momotombo shook the very foundations of the earth for over 20 years until it blew its top in 1610. Just like Pompeii, León Viejo was buried under a layer of ash. The Spanish colonists who survived the eruption fled to what is now the city of León. Then, slowly but surely, León Viejo faded into the background of history. In 1967, archaeologists from Nicaragua located the ruins of the old Spanish town. It was right where it was supposed to be, hidden in an abandoned section of jungle. Scientists then excavated a chapel and the central plaza, finding the founder's skeletal head. Three decades later, in 2000, León Viejo became the first UNESCO World Heritage Site in Nicaragua. But even still, few ever ventured to its ruins. That's because it's harder to reach and far more dangerous to explore than other famous sites like Machu Picchu. The Cosmic Observatory an unexpected discovery was made on the top of a mountain in Mexico. A man who hadn't anticipated turning into an accidental archaeologist was the one who made the monumental find. Our protagonist's name is Ezequiel Escurra. He's a conservationist and ecologist who for years has been investigating the origin of corn agriculture in Mesoamerica. While he was investigating farming techniques in the basin of Mexico, he stumbled upon some ruins on a mountain peak, and the ruins turned out to be the remains of a cosmic observatory. Before the days of the Spanish conquest, the indigenous people of Mexico had an incredible farming system. They knew exactly when to plant their crops for maximum yield, and they did this without the technology that Europeans had at the same time on the other side of the globe, like compasses, quadrants, and astrolabes for astronomical observations. Ezequiel wanted to learn how ancient civilizations kept track of the seasons without astronomical tools. He believed that the answer was waiting for him somewhere in the mountains. And over time, his main focus of attention became Mount Tlaloc. Soon, he and his team, his team being his daughter and a friend with a drone, found the ruins of a stone causeway. The causeway was made in a perfectly straight line pointing directly at where the sun rises on February 23rd or 24th. But why are these dates so important? That's because in the ancient Mexica calendar, February 23rd was the start of the new year. Nobody knows who built the causeway or when, but Ezequiel knows in his gut what it was used for. This was a mountain observatory designed to mark the beginning of the Mexica year. It was how the ancient people kept track of their seasons, and it was how they knew when to plant their crops. The Oasis Fortress The K-Bar Oasis isn't exactly the easiest place to reach. It's a remote desert watering hole in the middle of the wasteland known as Saudi Arabia. Or, to be more specific, it's an oasis in the sweltering heat of the North Arabian Desert. You could reach the oasis if you really tried, but it's not an easy journey. For thousands of years, the oasis has remained sheltered from the rest of the world by countless miles of windswept desert. In fact, it was only recently that archaeologists discovered that the K-Bar oasis was once protected by over 9 miles of walls. Archaeologists investigating the oasis identified one of the largest ancient walls of the prehistoric world. 4,000 years ago, the people who lived in the oasis decided to protect themselves from all manner of invasion. 
They enclosed an area of 2,700 acres, barricading themselves behind walls that were 8 feet thick in some places. They also built roughly 70 bastions, which were set into the walls as defensive towers. The K-Bar Oasis was a living fortress, a walled paradise in an otherwise bleak landscape. Outside the walls was death while inside the walls were sprouting trees, animals, fresh air, and clean drinking water. But there's a question I haven't addressed yet. Who could they have been trying to protect themselves against? Perhaps desert raiders, marauding nomads, or crazed cultists? It's tough to say what was happening 4,000 years ago since the ruins are in total shambles. But there's one other thing you should know. Researchers believe that there were many walled oases in the North Arabian desert four millennia ago. These would have been isolated havens in one of the harshest environments on Earth, and they were likely all walled to protect from outsiders. Adak Island Adak is the westernmost city in all of the United States, but I bet you can't find 10 people who have heard of it before. The city of Adak is located on Adak Island, which itself is in the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. Its history dates back thousands of years, starting with people hunting and gathering during the Ice Age. Then things got pretty rough during World War II, and a lot more changed in the modern era. The island is situated on the outskirts of the United States, almost as if it exists in a world of its own. It's right in the middle between Alaska and Russia. Although it's one of the most remote places in the world, it's not technically that hard to reach. You can fly to the island from Anchorage twice a week on a short three-hour flight. I said the history here dates back to the Ice Age, but the real truth is that nobody knows how long humans have been on Adak Island. It's just that finding proof of ancient habitation is difficult because of the horrible things that occurred here. The Unangaks, commonly known today as the Aleut, are the indigenous owners of the island. They were already occupying Adak Island, along with the rest of the Aleutian Islands, when Russians appeared in the 1800s. Russian explorers devastated the indigenous population, though there are no records saying how many people were massacred. All anybody knows is that the Aleut population declined sharply after the Russians showed up. Then, in World War II, Japan attacked Dutch Harbor east of Adak and took control of nearby islands. It was the only time since the War of 1812 that a foreign power seized any piece of American soil. It didn't last long, though, with the Americans committing to a campaign to oust the Japanese. By 1943, 90,000 American troops were stationed in Adak, and when World War II came to an end, Adak remained an important military facility because of the island's proximity to Russia. With the fall of the Soviet Union, the Adak Naval Station became redundant. In 1997, it closed its doors and the population declined yet again. For the first time in two centuries, the land was returned to the indigenous Aleuts, and these days there are about 200 people living in Adak, although in total there are an estimated 15,000 people with Aleut ancestry alive today. As for ancient places on the island, there aren't any. You can see the abandoned military roads and plenty of deserted homes from when there were 90,000 more people on the island. But whatever homes or forts the Aleut built thousands of years ago are long gone. The City of the Jungle The Upano area of eastern Ecuador is mostly impassable and unexplored jungle. It's remote, largely untouched, and dominated by an enormous volcano. Past volcanic eruptions have created some of the richest and most fertile soils in the Amazon. However, scientists think the volcano may have also destroyed an entire civilization. In this remote part of Ecuador, scientists have found an ancient city. It was hidden for thousands of years underneath the jungle canopy. But what's truly amazing is that this discovery could change everything historians know about the original people of the Amazon. Professor Stephen Rostain was the team leader for the investigation. The professor said the city is older than any other known site in the Amazon. He said that it's about 2,500 years old. Nobody has figured out how big the city was, 
but they think it was enormous. The lost city of the jungle could have contained anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 people. If true, this would make it one of the biggest cities in the world in 500 BC. A civilization blossomed and thrived here, occupying the area for 1,000 continuous years until they vanished. The people in this nameless jungle metropolis were around for twice as long as the Roman Empire. Just think about how incredible that is. A whole civilization, their culture, their secrets, their hopes, everything a mystery, buried underneath a volcanic soil deep in the Ecuadorian Amazon. The Lost City of the Kalahari The Kalahari is one of the driest, most brutal places in the world. It's hot, bleak, and desolate. Miles of sandy nothingness stretch into the wavering distance. Explorers in this region have gotten lost and, unfortunately, most of them starved. They've walked away into the sand never to be seen again. Yet somewhere in this expansive world of sunstroke and stunted trees, there is said to be a lost city. The lost city of the Kalahari is by far the most impossible place to reach in today's video because nobody has ever found it. In 1885, American explorer William Leonard Hunt traveled to the Kalahari in Namibia, Africa. As he journeyed through the wasteland, he came across what appeared to be the ruins of stone walls. He also claimed to have found circular structures held together by the remnants of what looked like cement. Some of these walls even had evidence of writing on them. So, William believed that he'd come across proof of an ancient civilization. Unfortunately, though, this was in the 19th century. William didn't exactly have his camcorder on him to record the evidence. All he could really do was return to civilization and tell others about what he had seen. It's been almost 140 years since William's discovery, and nobody has ever found the stone walls he spoke of. Over 30 expeditions have gone deep into the desert in search of the lost city, but nobody has found so much as a busted piece of pottery or a single brick. So, does this mean that William was lying? Or could it be that the Kalahari Desert is so big and so empty that this city continues to elude modern researchers? The answer could be a little of both. Maybe William only thought he uncovered a lost city. Or maybe there is proof of a grand culture that thrived in the Kalahari, but their city walls have since been completely swallowed by the restless sands. Treasures of Olympus One of the most popular things to do in Greece as a tourist is to climb Mount Olympus. People come from all over the globe to ascend this legendary mountain to the very seat of the gods high in the clouds. It isn't an impossible place to reach, but the climb up certainly isn't for the faint of heart. The first people to reach the top of Mount Olympus were Frederick Boissonas and his Swiss climbing team in 1913. Since then, the ascent to the top has gotten a lot easier. About 10,000 people climb Olympus every year, most of them only to get to the secondary peak known as Sculio, but there are still some who get to the top. Mount Olympus isn't just famous for its tall peak. The mountain is covered in treasures, some from the ancient past and some from the more recent past. The ruins of the old monastery of St. Dionysus can be found on the slopes of the mountain. Established in 1542, the remote monastery lasted until World War II when it was destroyed by the Nazis. About 20 minutes away from the crumbling monastery is another ruin a chapel tucked inside a mountain cave. The castle of Platamon belonged to the Crusaders in the 13th century. It stands distinguished and robust on the side of the mountain, overlooking the historic passage connecting Macedonia with Thessaly. But the most famous site of all is the Dion Archaeological Park. Dion was a real city on Mount Olympus, the epicenter of Zeus's worship. After all, how could you live on Mount Olympus and not dedicate your city to the big guy with the lightning bolts? Dion developed over 2,000 years ago, but then it was taken over by the Romans. At some point in the 10th century, it was deserted. Thanks for watching! 
Which of these faraway ancient places would you like to explore the most? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Weris Megaliths In the small Belgian village of Weris, not far from Luxembourg, there is a group of megalithic monuments called the Weris Megaliths. These enormous structures are scattered over an area of about 5 miles long and form a unique set of ancient stone pillars from a bygone age. There are multiple standing stones, along with old chamber tombs called dolmens, and it all dates back to roughly 3000 BC. That was about 5,000 years ago, at a time when the mysterious Sen Ois Marne culture dominated this part of Europe. Because these stone creations were built so long ago, researchers don't know that much about them. The dolmens are definitely burial tombs. The bodies had been buried deep underground, with the graves covered over by gigantic rocks, and then rough slabs of stone were placed over the graves to protect them. Dolmens were the earliest types of tombs a rudimentary step up from burial cairns that were basically just piles of rocks thrown over a body. Sadly, by the time archaeologists discovered the tombs, they had already been pillaged and picked through. Very little is known of what was inside them, and for that matter, very little is known about the standing stones scattered about in the region. No one knows if the megalithic stones were used for travel markers, if they had something to do with astronomy, or if they were just put there for fun. Maybe all of the above. Whalebone Alley In 1976, archaeologists in the Soviet Union came across a strange structure in Siberia. They uncovered two parallel rows of whale bones that had been jabbed into the snow to create a kind of morbid arched walkway. It's almost like a portal, made of whale jaw and rib bones that tower about 16 feet high and weigh about 660 pounds each. There were a total of 34 whale bones discovered, and they all belonged to bowhead whales. These would have been easy enough to catch even for primitive Siberians. But the real mystery has been trying to figure out who created Whalebone Alley and why. This curious archaeological site is located on Isigran Island in the Bering Sea. It's actually only a few miles from the coast of Alaska. Whoever created the creepy, weird structures would have done so a very long time before the Russians ever claimed Siberia for themselves. The site is at least 600 years old, still somehow in almost perfect condition. The bones were shoved into the ground and then propped up straight with rocks, and nothing has pushed them over in nearly a millennia. Forty years after the discovery, scientists are still scratching their heads. People call it Siberia's answer to Stonehenge although it's definitely more ominous. The best guess archaeologists have for the purpose of Whalebone Alley is that it was built by Inuit tribes as a kind of neutral place of peace. Think of it like a demilitarized zone where various chiefs could discuss their issues without fear of repercussions. Iwami Ginzan Silver Mine In Japan, the Iwami Ginzan Silver Mine was one of the premier silver mines in the world starting in 1527. For just shy of 400 years, the mine produced flawless silver and made the townsfolk and many people of the Shimane prefecture quite wealthy. Japan copied the method of refining silver from their neighbors in Korea in 1533. Thanks to the Koreans, the Japanese learned how to melt silver ore into an alloy to better extract the silver, which greatly increased their silver production. But what's really amazing is the whole area of Iwami Ginzan is basically stuck in time. There are over 1,000 mine shafts spread throughout the forest, so many that a person could get lost and never see the light of day again. The small town of Omori, which sprang up beside the mine, is also a historical treasure, and a fascinating and strange one at that. It's still home to an ancient magistrate's office, Residences of real samurai who may have been used to protect the silver and the mine's overlords, and mysterious cave shrines carved into the mountainside. The town itself doesn't look like it's changed much since the 16th century. Nayang Ohak Nayang Ohak is a surreal place in Myanmar filled with crumbling jungle temples. It's not on any popular tourist map and people definitely aren't flying all over the world to see this strange place. 
and yet it is one of the most jaw-dropping archaeological sites in Southeast Asia. It's situated next to the beautiful Inle Lake and appears to be something out of a fairy tale. This site is extremely difficult to reach. The only way there is to travel by boat into the middle of absolutely nowhere and then walk to the rustic village of Indane where people are still living simple, disconnected lives. Then, on the outskirts of the peaceful and traditional village, there is Nayang Ohak. It's a small collection of Buddhist stupas that date back to the 17th century, roughly 400 years ago. The history behind each and every stupa has mostly been lost, and very little has been done to keep them from falling apart. It's almost like a graveyard of temples, with rich mosaics falling off the walls, shoeless children playing in the dirt, trees growing out of the peaked ceilings, and cracked Buddha statues gradually decaying into nothing. Big thank you to Bridget Fitzgerald and Desi Simmons. Thanks so much for spending time with us. If you are new here, welcome! And be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. Sidon Sidon is a very old city originally inhabited by the Phoenicians. It's located in what is today Lebanon, just a few miles south of Beirut. And although the city of Sidon may not look that special, it was once the most wealthy and powerful city-state in all of Phoenicia. The people here made a name for themselves by manufacturing purple dye and then shipping it around the world. The color purple was made famous by the craftsmen of Sidon and was so rare and expensive that it quickly became synonymous with royalty. This was over 2,000 years ago. And yet even though so much time has passed, Purple is still directly associated with people of extreme wealth and royal families around the world. And it's all because of one Phoenician city. But that's not all Sidon was known for. It was inhabited at least 6,000 years ago, producing massive amounts of glass in the 8th century BC, and they were known for being particularly cosmopolitan. In antiquity, Sidon could have been compared to somewhere like San Francisco for its progressiveness. In fact, Princess Jezebel came from Sidon and was the daughter of King Ethbal. She was mentioned in the Bible, and so too is Sidon multiple times. The city was such a big deal for so many centuries that everyone knew where it was. It was so popular that it managed to spread Phoenician culture across much of the known world. This was the city that ruled them all up until the Phoenician civilization began to face internal problems. The government fell apart and Rome took control after the death of Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Yan Tse Tsong Its song is a very distinctive type of architectural building found primarily in the hermit countries of Bhutan and Tibet. These are some of the most isolated places in the world. Ancient civilizations that have been reduced to obscurity and are hidden away along the border of China in a region nearly impossible to reach. And although most people don't consider Bhutan and Tibet to be all that important historically, especially compared to somewhere like Rome, they were both major players in Asia. Humans have lived in both regions for thousands of years, and because of their isolation, they developed their own unique architectural styles and cultural nuances. The Tsong was a kind of fortified monastery with great towering walls to surround an interior complex of courtyards, temples, and monk dwellings. A tsong could serve as a military or administrative complex, or even as a social center for an entire region. Arguably, the most impressive tsong still standing is the Gyantse Tsong in Tibet, finished in 1390 AD to guard Lhasa and the entrance to the Sangpo Valley. Today, the ancient fortress is situated high above the small town of Gyantse on a spur of jagged brown rock. There would have been no way into the fortress without scaling the rock or climbing the stairs, and so the chance of invasion was quite slim. The original fortress began construction around 838 AD, but it wasn't until 1268 that the massive walls were constructed around it. The palace was built in 1365 by a local prince named Pakpa Peltsang Po, and the whole place reached its height by the turn of the 15th century. Alas, the one thing the Tibetan people had never expected was the British. When the British showed up in Tibet, the defenders of Gyantse Tsong were outmatched. They had spears and slingshots and extremely out-of-date matchlock guns, while the British had unstoppable machine guns. 
The Brits took the fortress, raised the Union Jack, and that was the start of British rule. Senegambian Stone Circles When we think about stone circles, our minds almost immediately go to England and Western Europe, but outside of places like Stonehenge and the Karnak Stones in France, there are still monumental stone circles, like the ones in Gambia, called the Senegambian Stone Circles. This isn't just one circle of stones, but multiple circles. About 1,000 of them spread across a massive area over 100 miles long. Even though not many people have heard of this place, it is actually the largest concentration of stone circles anywhere in the world. This was a sacred landscape used by the ancient residents of Gambia in Africa for over 1,500 years. It's been considered one of the greatest archaeological marvels on Earth since it was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2006. But believe it or not, the site isn't alone. Spread between Senegal and Gambia are 29,000 stones, 17,000 monuments, and 2,000 sites that are almost identical. The monuments all consist of upright pillars, many that still stand as straight as the day they were laid. The big surprise is that nobody knows what they were used for. Researchers aren't even sure exactly when the monuments were built, but agree it was most likely around the 3rd century BC. Burial mounds have been found dating back to 927 AD, but there could be older ones never uncovered. The stone monuments were almost certainly used for ritual purposes, and yet there is no hard evidence. But there is hard evidence of an extraordinary society here. The dedication to move and shape 29,000 stones would have required a prosperous civilization. But we don't know who they were, where they went, or even if they had great cities in the area. Herodium Herodium was the megalithic palace of Herod I, aka Herod the Great. It was built at the top of a hill in Israel around the year 23 BC. At this time, Herod was the king of Judea, but technically subservient to the Roman Empire. Herod is particularly famous these days for his ambitious building projects. He was also behind the fortress of Masada, the great tomb of the patriarchs, and a costly renovation of the second temple in Jerusalem. But out of all of his great building projects, Herodium was one of the greatest. According to the Roman Jewish historian Josephus, the king built his great city palace on the very spot where he fought a great battle against the last Hasmonean king, Antigonus. The palace was then built into one of the most fabulous places of the ancient world. It was rich with sprouting gardens, stables for the horses, a luxurious pool complex, and an endless supply of water brought up the hill by a system of highly advanced aqueducts and reservoirs. There was one main palace at the top and then a second palace even bigger on the lower flanks of the hill. These days, it's hard to imagine Herodium's greatness. The place is now a dusty ruin without a drop of water in sight. Runestone Hill Runestone Hill in Sweden, also called Runstenskollen, isn't your average archaeological site. In fact, it's really just a tiny mound in the center of Lund outside the local university. It takes us back to a bygone age of Vikings and magical runestones. These stones never actually came from this spot, but were brought to the university from various sites across Scandinavia. Each runestone is only about three feet tall, and they were placed on a mound in a tight circle in the way they may have been placed hundreds of years ago. Each stone is inscribed with runic text describing the deaths of Vikings in Northern Europe. For example, the Valleberga stone was discovered back in 1845, being used as a fence post by some country folk. Written on the stone are the names of Man and Sven. These were two Vikings who likely lived in Tingaladet, England, back in the 11th century AD. That was shortly after the Nordic conquest of England in 1016. According to the stone, these two warriors fell in battle and were buried in London and now their stone is keeping their memory alive all the way in Sweden. Lake Monroe Lake Monroe is one of the most interesting archaeological sites in Indiana. Although to be fair, the lake itself isn't an archaeological site. It's more of a concentration of different sites. Back in 1976, researchers with Indiana University discovered over 100 different places of archaeological value surrounding the lake with at least one of them being the most important in all of Indiana, and maybe even the United States. 
All of these decades later, work is still being done to uncover the mysteries of who lived at Lake Monroe. Epsilon II is the most famous site at the lake. All kinds of spear points were found here – arrowheads, mollusk shells, pieces of pottery, animal bones, and everything having to do with human existence in the centuries before Europeans arrived. The artifacts date back to the Archaic period of North America. This was between 8000 BC and 1000 BC and was a time when Native Americans were practicing an economy of nuts, seeds, and shellfish. They had also recently adopted farming, which began to change the topography of the Americas. We don't actually know which group lived on the shores of the lake, and no large structures have ever been identified. All we have are old artifacts, arrowheads, and proof that very primitive people had made their home on the shores of this lake, likely in many small settlements. Makiris Makiris can be found in the Dead Sea of Israel, not far from Amman. It's an old mountain fortification in the middle of a desert, not the easiest place to find or journey to. It was once home to a truly enormous fortification, a kind of military palace where John the Baptist was kept prisoner and later decapitated. Here's a quick recap. John the Baptist preached repentance at the Jordan River. He baptized people so that they could be born anew, and he preached about the coming of Jesus the Messiah, whom he claimed was his cousin. He also criticized the powerful ruler Herod Antipas, who was the governor of Galilee and Perea. John the Baptist was mostly displeased about the fact that Herod had married Herodias illegally, the wife of his half-brother. So Herod locked John the Baptist in the inescapable prison at Machaerus, but he did not kill him. Herod knew that John was a holy man, and he liked to listen to him talk. It wasn't until Herod had a birthday banquet that things went very wrong. Herodias, Herod's wife, plotted to have John killed. She had her daughter, Salome, seduce Herod with a dance so that he would offer her anything she pleased. She said the only thing she wanted was the head of John the Baptist. And so he was beheaded, and his skull was brought to the 14-year-old girl on a silver platter. The details are a bit murky, but this all happened inside Machaerus, also known as the Black Fortress. It was built at the very edge of the Jordan Valley, high up on a precipice overlooking the Dead Sea. It was a truly strange place to build a fortification, and would have been a logistical nightmare getting supplies from the cities miles away to the palace that sits 1100 meters above the Dead Sea. The Gardens of the Anunnaki The gardens of Ashurbanipal were constructed at the ancient Assyrian capital of Nineveh, which was one of the very first vast metropolises on the planet. The greatest of the Assyrian kings built palaces to display their power, and they surrounded their palaces with splendid gardens and parks stocked with the most exotic foods and beautiful orchards. Not only would the Assyrian kings fill their gardens with the most exotic plant life, but they also brought animals from all over the globe to be pets inside their gardens. Under the pear, pomegranate, olive, and fig trees, lions and tigers sat bathing in the sun. But here's where things get really interesting. There are a few different theories regarding Nineveh and the gardens of Ashurbanipal. One says the Assyrians were believed to have close ties with the Anunnaki. We know the Sumerians and Akkadians worshipped the Anunnaki as gods, and the tradition was passed on through the Assyrians to the Babylonians. Some think the Anunnaki came from space and bestowed knowledge upon the Sumerians, which they used to build the first great cities on Earth. Following this logic, you can only assume that the Anunnaki had some hand in building Nineveh. After all, it was the largest city in the world for a half a century, up until civil war struck Assyria in 612 BC, and the city was abandoned. Also abandoned was the Great Garden, an impossible menagerie of plants and animals kept green and fertile by an immense canal network. The canal stretched all the way from the distant mountains to Nineveh, where it fueled the wealth of the first real metropolis until the people within tore themselves apart. Lost Kingdom of Tibet The ruins of Guj are located on the roof of the world, in the wild plateaus of Tibet. The only way to reach this incredibly isolated ruin is to start from Lhasa, the capital of Tibet and then journey across one of the most isolated regions on Earth. It's a vast and uninhabited desert of rocks, ice, and wildlife. We don't really know what happened to the Kingdom of Guj. There is a legend that says in the first part of the 20th century, the Tibetan government sent an envoy out into the wilderness to collect tax from them. But when the envoy returned, 
They claimed the entire city had been buried in sand, and the taxation plan was dropped. To this very day, very little research has been done in Tibet, and almost nothing in the way of archaeology. Historical records show that the Kingdom of Guj ruled a mighty empire for at least 700 years there, between the 9th century and the 17th century. There were over 16 kings, but we don't know how they initially rose to power or why they vanished. Everything seemed to be going great until the people suddenly disappeared and their greatest city was left buried under the sand. These days, the ruins of Guj are everywhere. Archaeologists have identified the city itself as the second largest ruin in Tibet, following the Potala Palace in Lhasa. They've also found 445 earth and wood structures, over 879 caves that may have been inhabited, 58 fortifications, plenty of secret tunnels, and almost 30 traditional Buddhist stupas. The Wreckage of the Mentor There is a fantastic archaeological site that is very hard to get to. That is, unless you're an expert diver and not afraid of descending into the black depths of the sea off the coast of Avlemonas, Greece. That's because I'm talking about a shipwreck, a vessel called the HMS Mentor, which went down in September of 1802. The ship itself wasn't that ancient, but the cargo it contained most certainly was. It had on board 17 crates of antiquities, and all of them tumbled into the Mediterranean Sea and were lost for 200 years. According to the Greek Ministry of Culture, archaeologists have finally discovered the wreckage and have been busy trying to bring the lost artifacts back to the surface. So far, the team of underwater divers has found gold jewelry, ancient chess pieces, and artifacts that had been pillaged from the Parthenon in Athens. The HMS Mentor had originally been commissioned by a Scottish nobleman named Thomas Bruce to transport artifacts from the Parthenon to Great Britain. At the time, Thomas Bruce was serving as the British ambassador to the Ottoman Empire and was something of a treasure thief. He may have been an ambassador, but he looted untold valuables from all over Greece during the early 1800s. The Mentor only contained a single shipment. However, there had been plenty more. Modern archaeologists have already discovered pieces of Egyptian sculptures, amphorae, and marble from the Parthenon. I want to give a quick shout out to Lyrics and Typhon. Thanks so much for watching and spending time with us. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We have lots more videos coming up. Aktun Tunichil Muknal. The Aktun Tunichil Muknal Cave, or ATM Cave for short, is not the easiest place to reach, partly because it's underground and partly because it's in the wild jungles of Belize. The cave itself was once used as a sacrificial site for the Mayans. Archaeologists have discovered pots, skulls, ceremonial altars, and tons of other morbid artifacts that had laid untouched for hundreds of years. The only way into this terrifying cave of doom is by delving deep into the Mountain Tapir Reserve, a seriously remote tropical jungle. You have to bring jungle hiking gear, then bushwhack your way to the cave before slipping through 12 feet of water just to reach the entrance. Once inside, you can see the dark and haunted cavern where Mayan shamans and religious leaders sacrificed the innocent and offered their blood to the gods. Rabana Merkuli Rabana Merkuli is in the Zagros Mountains, at the edge of a rocky outcrop in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. It's nothing but a busted ruin today, but may have once been the city of Natunia, which was lost for thousands of years. We only actually know about this city because archaeologists found its name on coins, which date back to the 1st century BC. Excavations started in 2009 and have continued all the way into 2022. Archaeologists have revealed over a mile of fortifications, two small settlements, and evidence that they were all part of one massive city. This city may have been a kind of religious stronghold filled with temples dedicated to the Zoroastrian goddess Anahita. Another interesting thing about this place is that archaeologists have found multiple statues and rock reliefs depicting an unknown ruler. This same anonymous ruler is carved everywhere, etched into the face of multiple cliffs and in both these smaller settlements. Researchers think the face could belong to Natunisar, the legendary founder of Natunia, this city on the mountain. Archaeologists in Greece have discovered something absolutely unbelievable. On the very top of Mount Pidos, 
Over 3,500 feet above sea level, the ruins of an unknown ancient city were found. These ruins are currently believed to be the highest archaeological site in Greece, basically the Mount Olympus of lost cities. This place wasn't just hard to get to, it was nearly impossible to get to. Just to visit someone living in the city, a person would have needed to climb all the way to the mountain peak, where they would have probably been dizzy and sick from the altitude. Based on what the archaeologists have found at the site, including the remains of temples and fragments of inscriptions, this was a holy place. It was a sacred site for the Macedonians in the 4th century BC. We don't actually know the name of this city. It doesn't seem to be marked in any historical records, but we can clearly see it was occupied by priests and caretakers and that it was destroyed less than 200 years after it was created. There was a massive acropolis in this mountaintop city, and archaeologists have determined it was destroyed by the 2nd century BC. If the Acropolis was destroyed, chances are all the other buildings went with it. It's a shame because we don't know which god from the Greek pantheon was worshipped here, or what could have motivated someone to climb to the top of the mountain just to burn a city down. Ancient Stone Age Cave Deep in the wilds of Kenya, archaeologists stumbled upon an enormous cave. After a bit of exploring, they discovered some of the oldest examples of technological ingenuity by human hands. What I mean is that they found advancements in technology from 60,000 years ago, hidden in the middle of the African wasteland, far from modern society. Here's what the archaeologists discovered. They found red crayons that are 48,000 years old. They also found decorated beads made from seashells and pieces of ostrich eggs. According to expert Dr. Suri Shipton, an archaeologist from the Australian National University, all these artifacts point to a major turning point in the history of humanity. Shipton says that about 60,000 years ago, humanity's lifestyle suddenly changed. The people who had lived in this cave were used to hunting and gathering, and suddenly were doing things like making necklaces out of beads and drawing with crayons. He also compared this leap in technology to the invention of the smartphone and even the automobile. While that may sound like a stretch, it actually isn't. Imagine a group of humans who had never done anything except eat and breed, and suddenly they were learning how to create art. It would have been like giving a gaming console and a flat-screen TV to a person from the 17th century. Greenin of Ailich The Greenin of Ailich is an ancient fortress sitting at the very top of a short mountain in Ireland. It's at the peak of Greenin Mountain, 800 feet high in County Donegal. There is not much of the structure left today, just the ruins of a highly advanced ring fort that had been built around the 6th or 7th century. It's believed the northern Yui Neil were behind the construction of the ring fort. This was a group of warriors who claimed to be descendants of the legendary hero Neil of the Nine Hostages. They lived in northwestern medieval Ireland and were one of the many factions that ruled the land. By the 12th century, shortly after the fortress was built, it became the seat of the kings of Ailich. The fort sat at one of the highest places in Ireland, from which the newly proclaimed kings could watch over their lands. It was a pretty beefy fortress with walls 16 feet high and 15 feet thick. It had three internal terraces, winding passages inside, and was nearly invincible on its high hilltop. With enough warriors inside its walls, it was easy to defend by raining arrows down on any men dumb enough to try scrambling up the steep mountainside. By the 12th century, the kings of Ailich were losing power and territory. The Normans were invading, and the fortress was finally captured and destroyed by the king of Munster in 1101. Uzundara Fortress The Uzundara Fortress in Uzbekistan is in the absolute middle of nowhere. It was once a border outpost protecting the ancient land of Bactria. It was part of a larger system of fortifications protecting their borders from raiding nomads, but even back then it was incredibly remote. It was built sometime around the 3rd century BC, over 3,000 years ago, during the rule of Antiochus I of the Seleucid Empire. Shortly after the fortress was built, it was destroyed. Even though the fortress had been constructed with the sole purpose of defending against nomads, it was a group of nomads who showed up and tore the stones asunder. Recently, archaeologists have been excavating the ruins of the ancient fortress. They've discovered chunks of a defensive tower, pieces of the fortress walls, and a handful of interesting artifacts. Bactria was occupied by a race of Iranians, 
deep in the Hindu Kush mountains at the corner of Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. Not exactly the easiest place to reach. This was a major center for early Zoroastrianism, one of the world's earliest religions. But then it was taken over by Alexander the Great in the 4th century, and the people were subjugated. After Alexander's death, Bactria was annexed by the general Seleucus I. This outpost fortress, at the very edge of the mountainous region, fell shortly after that to the random fury of the tribal nomads. Thanks for watching! How far would you travel to explore one of these mysterious ancient places? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon! Bye!